Yeah, Lord, we could sing that all day long. Your blood and your love speaks to us of the grace we so desperately need. And Lord, we thank you for the grace that has already been poured out this morning. But we pray as we share your word and your stories, God, of love towards us, that we would be set free again into your goodness and into your loving kindness. We pray that in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Well, it is so good to be together. So glad that you're here with us. It's been a it's been a beautiful week, and uh, it started on Thursday night as we celebrated the Passover at a Monday Thursday gathering, and then we had Good Friday, uh, a service as well. So powerful, just that quiet sobriety of okay. Jesus truly has come and sacrificed for us. But then yesterday we had an outreach at Sealy Park, and uh, we had over 500 people from our neighborhood come. We uh, saw over 20 people make decisions to follow Jesus. We prayed for so many different people. I remember praying for a couple people with cancer that were just desperate for God. And I just thought, man, I'm so glad we were there right? They were just desperate for a touch from God, prayed for them, prayed for some sons and daughters. But the big kind of crescendo event uh, was the Easter egg hunt. And there it is. We had over 12,000 plastic eggs filled with candy and a few prizes. And man, you didn't want to get in the middle of that. Uh, Everybody went away happy and filled, and I always said, I told Jason, who uh, let out yesterday, I said, man, where there's food, family, fun, and free, it brings the crowds. Uh, so it's been a great Easter weekend, and it's just so uh, powerful when we take time to remember and to reflect on Jesus and all that he's done. Hey, I want to start off with a little story leading into my sermon. A few years ago, I was with some friends, and the wives had gotten together for my friend's birthday and said, hey, we're going to let you guys go to the escape room. It was kind of new in Waco at the time, and so five of us are in this escape room, and uh, you know, we're trying to figure it out, and we're just uh, probably guys that don't know as much as we think we do, and it became obvious as the time was ticking away that we were not going to make it out of there unless some clues started dropping really fast. So we're, let's say if there's seven stations, we're at number five, and there's five minutes left, and I'm saying, this is not happening. I mean, I, I'm not the sharpest knife in the door, but I can tell you this probably not going to happen. So I just thought, well, you know what? I'm going to go over to the door code and I'm just gonna ask the Holy Spirit how to get out of here. These guys can keep reason among themselves. So I literally, I'm not kidding, there's a one in 10,000 chance, there were four numbers you had to have, one in 10,000 chance, and some over there, Lord Jesus, two, four, six, eight, nope, uh, Lord Jesus, help me. And I'm doing, on the fourth try, all four numbers hit, and we're out of there! <laughs> Woo! I haven't been able to repeat that feat since then. But what it was is I cracked the code. Actually, I didn't crack the code. God cracked the code for a bunch of dumb friends that couldn't get out of the escape room themselves. Obviously, the illustration should be clear. God has cracked the code for the longing of our hearts to be loved and to know what love is, to have meaning in life. God has cracked the code by his grace through, through his death, burial, and resurrection. In August, we kind of laid out four big questions that I think everybody on the earth has. I've met Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists and secularists, people who didn't believe and did believe, and these are kind of the four big questions that kind of percolate in our hearts whether we know it or not, and that is, who is God? We have to answer that in our lifetime. The next question is, who am I? Who am I as a person? Do I matter? Am I of value? Who are my people? Who am I going to do this with? Because we're not made to walk alone. And what is my purpose in life? We spent some time unpacking it in August, but as I was preparing for Easter Sunday, I felt that God reminded me of that and said, now bring it forward because Easter explains and cracks the code forever to every one of those questions. So I want to rephrase it now. Because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, I can know. Everybody say, I can know. I can know. That's amazing. You can know. <laughs> I can know who God is. 
I can know who I am. I can know who my people are. And I can know what my purpose is. So I want to start unpacking that for the remainder of our time together. What does a death, burial, and resurrection do to answer those life questions that everybody in this room has and everybody uh, looking online? I want to start in a unique place, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. It says, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship or the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us, who is God. Jesus is the personification of grace. The Father is God who created us for his glory. The Holy Spirit is the now manifestation of God. There's this kind of cool Greek word called uh, perichoresis, and it's to try to describe that dance between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, that dance between God, the mystery of God, and that I love it because that word is where we get the word chore choreography, and it's like there's this dance going on all the time over God's creation, over our hearts or mind, this dance from heaven trying to let us see grace through Jesus, letting us know we're loved by the Father that created us, letting us know that God's with us by the Holy Spirit. But the beauty of that mystery is made plain in the person of Jesus. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, in these last days, God has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he, Jesus, is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power, when he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Therefore, this gospel, this good news is clarified in a person. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus said, I'm going to ascend to the Father. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. So that beautiful dance is made real, made right in the person of Jesus. And I just want to say, who is this for today? This is for you. For those who've known Jesus for a long time, it's a point of review to renew. For those who are far from God right now, it's a place to come back to if you've fallen away. For those who've never known, it's a place to know <laughs> the goodness of God. For those that are hurting and fearful and anxious and don't know which way is up, it's a place of centering up on God in the person of Jesus, and there is power in this room today to help you. It says this in Hebrews 12, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Everybody say Jesus, come on. Jesus. Fixing our eyes on? Jesus. Whoop, fixing our eyes on? Jesus. That whoop had nothing to do with Texas A&M. I want to acknowledge that I am not a part of that group. <laughs> Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, everybody say consider him, Woo. who endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and lose heart. Jesus has already gone before us so we can find grace and find strength. So what I wanna do is I wanna walk through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and I wanna answer that question, first of all, who is God? And of course, we, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of expressions of God, but I wanna just take the Easter story to remind us who God is. It begins on Thursday night, what's often called the Passover meal, we know as communion, where Jesus is celebrating this 1,500-year ritual that had been done by the Jewish people to commemorate their deliverance from slavery in Egypt. The Israelites had no way out. They had no hope. And God said, here's what you're going to do. You're going to take a spotless lamb. You're going to make a sacrifice of that lamb. You're going to put blood over the doorpost. And when the angel of death comes over Egypt, it's going to pass over your door because of the blood. If you feel like there's death in your life, the blood of Jesus can cover you from death. 
And not only did it cover them that night, but then it would make a way that they could walk through the Red Sea, the, one of the greatest miracles of all time, and they could be delivered from their enemies and delivered from death. So Thursday night, though we can see it as a Passover meal where Jesus had supper with his uh, disciples, he's also declaring, I am your deliverer. I am your deliverer and my body will be the blood that will be shed over that doorpost, not just as a memory, but as a right now reality for those who trust in me. So Thursday, we see Jesus as the deliverer, as the Passover. And then on Friday, we see not only his uh, betrayal, but then we see him at the cross. Again, the centrality of the beauty and the, and the pain of the cross. When Jesus hung on the cross, it says he bore your sins and my sins for all time. Romans 6, 10 says this, that for the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. Whew. I just, I could just pause there. When Jesus hung on the cross, he died once and for all, that my sins might be eradicated for all time, for eternity, forever and ever. And because of that full and complete sacrifice that Jesus became on my behalf, I have grace extended towards me when I trust in him. On the cross, Jesus very profoundly looked out on the crowd of sinners and he said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. I often think it is a bit uh, humorous, though also devastating, that we do not think that God knows everything we're doing. And we kind of think, well, you know, I'm kind of hiding from God. A actually, you're not. <laughs> uh, he knows all things. He sees all things. Actually, Hebrews says nothing in all creation is hidden from his sight. Whoa. Whoa. That is terrifying, wonderful, ter whoa, wow, what do I do with all that? But here's the deal, because of the blood of Jesus, he looks on you, even in your sin, with compassion to deliver you. If you're rebellious, he's made a way for you to repent and return. If you are weak in your flesh, he was weak as well, and he empathizes with you and is trying to set up a way of escape. If you find yourself confused, he says, I am the truth and the life. Jesus is yearning to, for you to know what forgiveness is because he has compassion and he understands your plight no matter where you are today. He looks out from the cross. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. And then he breathes his last breath and he cries out, it is finished. I, I want you to know, I take such comfort in looking at the story of the cross and reading the story of the cross and reviewing in my mind the story of the cross, actually not just on Easter, but every day. It is finished. It is done once and for all. I do not have to keep repeating my sacrifices. I do not have to keep, keep hoping there's a Savior out there. I don't have to keep repeating the same mantras. Once and for all, sin has been eradicated because there was one perfect sacrifice. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Therefore, every day, he literally extends grace towards me as I come under his rule and reign and I experience forgiveness once and for all. It is finished, my friends. You are not working your way to God. He has already made a way for you and he is working his way towards you. It is finished. Capturing this 700 years earlier, the prophet Isaiah said this, Speaking of Jesus, and I just want to pause for a minute. 700 years before the cross, God speaks through Isaiah of the exact event in detail that was happening on this Easter Sunday 2,000 years ago. And here it is, Isaiah 53. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. All the grief, all the pain, all the things that you don't know what to deal with, I often picture in my mind Jesus hanging on the cross and me just coming underneath his feet and saying, God, I can't. I don't know what to do anymore. I have grief. I have sorrow. I have loss. I'm disappointed in myself. I'm disappointed in others. I thought something else was going to turn out a different way, but I bring my grief and sorrow and I say, consume it. 
Lord Jesus. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, speaking of people's reactions to the cross in that moment. But he, Jesus, was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chasing for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, not just his hanging on the cross, but the preparation where he hung onto that pole and literally they whipped him with, the, with cords that had little uh, stones and glass on the edge of it, ripped out literally his flesh was, and stripes came on his back and his body even before the cross it says, but those stripes were necessary so that you can be healed. They're necessary so that you can be healed. Everything that Jesus did was to be the perfect sacrifice so you could have access to the grace that you would need. By his scourging, we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity, the sins of us all to fall on him. If you guys have been with us through the years, you know that one of my big kind of things I like to talk about is literally in the old covenant, they would, the priest would lean into the sacrificial lamb, transferring the sins of the people onto that lamb. Then they would slain that lamb and that blood would be over the door, the doorway into the Holy of Holies, into God's grace. And that sacrifice transfer would cleanse him for the day. <laughs> but because it wasn't personal, they still lived under the bondage of sin. But once and for all, Jesus became that ultimate sacrifice. His blood was shed so that you don't have to look back. You can look forward and you can live in the present that that grace is always sufficient and always there to cover you and me. In the Matthew account of Jesus' death, it says this, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were open and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. That's an interesting thought for another time. Now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening became very frightened and said, truly this is the son of God. So we're trying to answer the question, who is God? He's your deliverer from slavery. He's your sin bearer because he is your healer and he is your way maker. That veil that was rent in the Holy of Holies in the temple was only for the priest, prophet, or king. But now in this day, it was ripped wide open so that all of us can run to the throne of grace and receive mercy and help in our time of need. The throne room is wide open because of the sacrifice of Jesus. It is affirmed here in scripture and is affirmed in history. God is available to his created ones, to his people, and he has made a way. He is a way maker. Early on in Laura's and my uh, journey, we ran a little missions training school and we would spend the summers in different countries of the world. This particular summer, we were in the uh, country of, uh, at that time, Czechoslovakia or Yugoslavia, excuse me, and we were headed to Bulgaria. Of course, this is Eastern Europe, right after the wall came down. And there's a war that broke out actually the day that we got there, of course. And um, this war breaks out, and so everyone's fleeing the city. So the main highway for us to get to uh, uh, down to Bulgaria is just wall-to-wall cars. And we have little walkie-talkies in the day. We didn't have phones. We had walkie-talkies between the two vans with all of our, our peeps. And we're going down the highway, and we can see, as far as the eye can see, just a traffic jam. And we're talking on the radio, Lord, uh, we pray, make a way. What are we supposed to do? We can't sit here, you know, for hours or maybe even days. What do we do, Lord? And about that time, as we're slowing down almost to a dead stop, this VW van kind of starts weaving between the cars. This blonde haired guy sticks his head out the window and he waves to us for us to follow him. And uh, we have this major highway, but there's a break in the fence on a little country road. And this guy's waving at us to follow him. And we said, is this the Lord or the devil? You know, what's going on? And uh, 
We all just kind of think it's the Lord. And then and somebody says, look, look, I know it's the Lord. And on the back of the VW uh, little micro bus, it had don't mess with Texas sticker. <laughs> In Yugoslavia. Amazing. So we said, that's our confirmation. That's all you need is a Texan. And we're on it. So we pull our vans into that country road. We drive for an hour and a half, and every once in a while we could see the traffic jam where there was no escape. Literally, people ran out of gas ultimately and just had to live there and camp there. And we were weaving in and out for an hour and a half. And then we get to this little town, this little intersection, and the blonde hair guy in the, in the microbus, he sticks out as he waves, he points to, for us to go to the right, and he waves to us, and literally we look up and he's gone. Isn't that amazing? We went right, and literally within a quarter of a mile, there is the border, and we are into Bulgaria. Now, that is a wild story. To illustrate this point, God's a way maker. He has a way of escape for you. Actually, Corinthians says that. When we get ourselves in bondage, and it's because when we get ourselves in bondage, <laughs> there's no temptation that has overtaken us, and whatever you've done, there is a way of escape. There is a way for it if you'll look up and ask God. And God reveals himself as the way maker in the throne of grace and the temple being rent so that we would always have hope and know that it's never over. Well, he died on the cross. He was buried. And on that day, Saturday, they call it Black Saturday, the confusion, the fear among his disciples, what's going on? But here's what was going on. Uh, under the earth, it says this in 1 John 3, 8, the son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. He ascended into hell and there he took on literally hell itself and became victorious on Saturday. It says in Colossians 2, 15, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Revelation 1, 18, Jesus says this of himself, I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and hell. <laughs> Woo! So during his burial, when we're all confused, God's working on our behalf to overthrow the enemy. That song, Waymaker, right? God is still working while I'm waiting. God is still working. My friends, stay in it with Jesus. Stay trusting, stay leaning in, stay reaching out. Stay among the people of God. While you're waiting, God is working. He has victory and he's able to work all things together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. It's never over. He is a way maker. He is victorious over hell and the demons of hell. And he is the resurrected one. Matthew 28, one through six. Now after the Sabbath has began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. Behold, a severe earthquake had occurred. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothes as white as snow. I would have loved to have been there. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Aren't you already scared? I mean, I like, wow, that's a little tough. But, it, but again, trying to bring peace to the ladies here. Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus. Isn't that great? I know you're looking for for the way maker, the deliverer, the friend, the one who loves you like no one's ever loved you before. Don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He's not here. <laughs> he is risen just as he said. And I'm sure their minds just went lightning fast back to John 11 where Jesus said to the women, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of the living God, even he who comes into the world. Question number one, who is God? Through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we see who God is. He is a deliverer. He is the bearer of our sins. He is a way maker. He is the victorious one. And he is the resurrection and the life that we may never have to fear death again because it has already been eradicated by his resurrection. 
Thank you, God, that in Jesus and the fullness of it, we can see a mystery made perfect. So, we had, so question number two, who am I? Now we know who God is. God is Jesus, the risen one who's made a way and waits for us and sitting at the right hand of the Father praying for us. But who am I? How, how do I fit into this story? I love Ephesians. It's, it takes us on that progression from sinner to rescued one to seated with Christ. It says this in Ephesians 2, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Everybody in this room, apart from the grace of God, we were all, we are all dead in our trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's the devil, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, everybody say, but God. Thank you, Lord, but God, being rich in mercy. He's not like us, you guys. He's rich in mercy. Think of the most merciful, merciful person you know. He's better than that, like by 100 miles, maybe, maybe a million miles. But God, being rich in mercy, compassionately, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Entering into our world, making everything possible that we might know grace. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace. Anybody want the riches of his grace? I, I want the riches of his grace and the riches of his mercy in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, that no one should boast. Woo! We've been delivered from darkness, Colossians says, and transferred into the, king, uh, into the kingdom of the beloved son. We are now his children by the grace of God. We have been forgiven, rescued, redeemed, and now positioned as his sons and daughters. I've shared often about a scripture that was very meaningful to Laura and I in college where uh, in Psalm 107, it says that God will bend the bars of your yoke to set you free. And this past week, there was uh, three day, four days, excuse me, of worship and prayer and preaching out of Baylor's campus. Beautiful, powerful, hundreds of responses to Jesus, people confessing sin, getting right with God. It was a beautiful experience. And there were two young ladies uh, who gave testimonies of being in addiction to pornography and being in addiction to uh, sexual brokenness and relationships, and they were very boldly sharing up there. Man, this is where I was, and I thought I was the only one, and then I confessed it, and the chains broke, or or the way they would just, one of them did describe it, like the bars bent, and I was set free. And as I was listening to them this week, I I I, I was just so in awe, like Lord, what you did forty years ago in Laura's and I my life, you're doing this week in Baylor again. And I felt like the Lord said, I want to do it today at Antioch. He bends the bars of our yoke, whatever it is that you feel imprisoned by. Jesus became the victorious one and went to hell itself to literally take the keys to open the doors or to bend the bars so that you might be rescued. And not just rescued, but then taken to his house. <laughs> I'm not, oh wow, I'm out of prison. I just go, no taken into his house as a son or as a daughter. Here's what the scripture says about being his sons and daughters. 2 Corinthians 6, 18. I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Just let this wash over you. For all who are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons and daughters of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery. That's the devil and that's the world. To fall back into fear but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Hebrews 2, 
For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. 1 John 3, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we shall be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall be, we will see him as he is. Our dear friend Mick Murray, one of our pastors on our team here, talks about um, being born uh, uh, outside of marriage. His mom was 13 years old. He was given up into adoption. And in the uh, state of Oklahoma, it was a sealed adoption. And as he's done his research, obviously, and looking for his own uh, place of comfort, healing, and restoration, he said the, the actual document says, literally, they rewrite the birth certificate. So that yes, that one's sealed, but then they give a new birth certificate that he is born into the family that adopted him. They are now his covenant keepers. They are now his guardians. He now has a full inheritance. He now is fully a part of their lives as if they had literally birthed him themselves. And he said, as I looked at that document and I understood the fullness of it, it was as if God spoke to me. And so it is, my son, even greater than this piece of paper is my love for you, my assurance. When you are adopted into the family of God, his covenant is sure because a covenant is not based on your faithfulness. It is based on his. He is the covenant keeper, the covenant initiator. He gave the adoption papers and he is going to fulfill his end of the bargain. He is immovable unshakable, always pursuing. And you may have drifted way off, but you're still his son if you've been born again by the grace of God. And you may have never come to Jesus, but I'm telling you, you're made in the image of God and he weeps and he's praying right now that you would turn your heart to him, that you might be adopted into his family and experience all the benefits of home. Come home. Father's waiting. Who we are, our adopted sons and daughters. Quickly, just answering the last two questions. Who are my people? (laughs) If I'm a son or daughter of God, then I am a part of a family. (laughs) Who is that family? Every person who's born again, every person that has given their hearts to Jesus becomes a part of the family of God. So you have family all over the world. Every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, every planet, every place on this planet, there are men and women of God who have given their lives to Jesus, have come into the family of God, and they have found the grace of God, not only to be sufficient, but to be a place of refuge called the church. And my encouragement to everybody in this room, because this is a day, or watching online, where you quote unquote come back to church. But remember, the word church is the word ecclesia, which means called out ones or the called together ones for the mission of God. You, the church is not this building. The church is not just an individual person or a church family. The church is God's people called together for his glory. And no matter the imperfections of it, no matter the brokenness of it, no matter the challenge of it, it's still your family. It is. It's still your family. We jokingly have found out through the years is that if, if, if you have trouble with your uh, mom or dad, if you are married, like I could complain about my family, but if Laura complained about my family, then we got a problem. <laughs> May we have that same posture. May we be healers, restorers, uniters. May we be who God's called each of us to be. And when we are, we experience family. We experience family, as I've said many times, by leaning into one another, not pulling away from one another. And there are processes for all the discipline and all the challenge, but I just want to say, come back home, my friends. Again, whether you're watching online or anywhere in this room, come home, come into the community. Well, I got disappointed, I got hurt. But listen, the very thing that, the very family, quote unquote, that hurt you is the only family that can ultimately heal you. You cannot be healed independently because you're just a part of a body. And for the body to heal, we all need to be together as the family of God. Hey, lastly, I want to say this, and then my friend Jason's going to come. 
This whole journey is trying to answer these core questions that all of us need to renew day by day. Who is God? Who am I? I'm a child of God. Who are my people? The family of God, the people of God. For what purpose? That God might be glorified in anything and everything that I do. As Jesus ascended to the Father in Acts 1, he sent the Holy Spirit and he said this, you shall receive power. Everybody say power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, both with the words you proclaim and the life that you live, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. My friends, because you are a part of the vine, because you are a part of the people of God, you have a purpose and a plan, and that is to glorify God in that unique assignment that you have in healthcare, in education, in industry, on the ball field, in the home, in the neighborhood, everywhere we go, we are the salt and the light. We have been made by God, the hope of the world, when we believe that we are who we call to be, and we get our identity correct in Jesus, then our assignment of how we serve can become powerful beyond what we could even imagine, and the world is desperate for a people who believe that family is not just for the home, but family is to be shared for the world. Malachi is the last chapter of the Old Testament preparing for the coming of Jesus. And the last three verses of Malachi uh, says this in Malachi 4, 5, and 6. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. The Old Testament ends saying, I'm going to send a prophet, that would have been John the Baptist, to preach repentance, turn from your sin and turn to God. Why? To restore the family to restore the family, not just personally, but worldwide, to restore the family, to bring family back into the centerpiece of God's grace. No matter how broken your family was, no matter what your family of origin is, God is offering you a new family, a new hope, and a new help. And when you find that new family, new help in Jesus, you might very well find strength and power to turn back to your family and be a restorer and a healer of their lives as well, because the curse goes on because the family is broken. But when people come to Jesus and get it right in who they are and who is God and who are my people and then begin to live on mission, they begin to restore lives for eternity, but also even in this world. Our friend Jason Ramos, many of you guys know Jason, incredible story of redemption. He walked into this house in 2008, some friends asked him to lunch, and it began a process of healing and restoration that had begun in prison. Since that time, Jason's family has been uh, not only come to Jesus, but so many powerful things going on. Uh, The story never ends. (laughs) And I wanted him to come give us the latest on this restoration of family this Easter Sunday to put hope in your hearts. Let's give it up for Jason. Thank you. So... So over the the last 10 years, I've gotten the opportunity to go in different prisons and jails and just share the story of finding Jesus and and the restoration journey and getting to share the stories of of different people in my family coming to know the Lord. But this past December was, was really beautiful. I got to take my sister, my brother, and my mother with me into the prison. And so many times I've shared the story. They weren't there. But as I shared the story, I, I said that my brother came to the Lord. And then, and then I, I said, and he's here right now. And I invited John up. And the ladies were just starting to cry. If you could see the prison, you know, right here. And, and then as I continued the story, I, my sister, who had went to prison, got out of prison, and went back to prison and gave her life to Jesus, I said, Missy's here right now. Missy, come on up. And all these women were just like, wow. And I said, but there was this one person still, um, many more, but one that I've been praying for my mother for the last 10 years who had been struggling and bondage and and trapped and I said and she came one day and she heard my brother John share his testimony about finding Jesus and that was the last time she ever used and she'd been free and I said mama come on up here and my mom came up here and the whole the whole place was just crying and and we invited the women up to pray and Missy had like 40 ladies in line just to get prayed for and they were crying and and it was just beautiful 
to see my family there. You know, my sister Missy, you know, she had been married and through their journey of brokenness, they were divorced and and then they both, but recently uh, they were restored and her husband Ricky, their ex-husband Ricky, he had came home and this past March 1st, they were remarried. Our loving Jesus. And it's just the testimony, the scripture says we shall overcome by the blood of the lamb Mm. and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to death. Last Saturday, my sister and I, we drove down to South Texas and we visited my dad who's in prison as well. And we sat there and we had a great visit. And as we visited at the end of our time, I said, I said, hey, dad, how can I be praying? And immediately he was like, well, pray for the kids and, you know, for a safe drive home. I said, no, but for you, dad, how can I pray? And he, said, and he just got a, a, just a somber look. He said, pray if I'm my way back to him. And I said, absolutely, dad. <laughs> and we begin to pray right there. And today, I just want to encourage everybody in this room right now that God, that Jesus has made a way back to him. Mm. If you're far from him, he's made a way back to him. If you've never came to him before, he's made a way to him to experience the hope that is found in him. Amen. Amen. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, Jason. Hey, let's all stand together. If our prayer teams can come up to the front, we have prayer teams on the landing. We've got a few more minutes here, probably five to ten more minutes. And this is our response to Jesus our response to God. If you need to come home, if you need to be saved, if you need to come for the first time to God and confess your sins, just start coming. If you're a prodigal and you need to start coming home, you need to come back to him. Just come on down. If you need prayer, like my friends in the park yesterday that had cancer or a son that was struggling with ADHD and was going to be put into, into an institution and held up his mom as we prayed with tears. If you have a specific need this morning, that's physical or mental or emotional, we are here to pray for you. We're not just having religious services this Easter Sunday. We're here to help you find the grace of God as the family of God and to find the restoration and healing that he has for you. And for the families that are out there, it's not too late. It's not too late, my friends, those online, it's not too late. Yeah, things happen. There's consequences for the brokenness of our lives, but it's never too late for those who trust in Jesus. And my prayer is this morning, you found that hope. So I'm gonna lead us in prayer right now. If you're hearing the sound of my voice, you don't know Jesus, I'm gonna lead you to him. You can pray this prayer or you can start coming down or you can start coming up for prayer. I always say this, don't let anyone or anything keep you from getting the help that you need. You can start moving anytime while I'm praying. But if you're here in the sound of my voice, you don't know Jesus, I'm gonna pray a simple prayer. If you know Jesus and you don't need prayer right now, would you pray for someone who doesn't know Jesus? Would you pray for prodigals to come home as I pray right now? So Lord, we're all here in that throne of grace that's wide open and we come to you, our great sin bearer. And if you need Jesus, I just want you to pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you. Forgive me of my sins. You're just acknowledging your need. Forgive me of my sins. I believe you died on the cross for me. You're just confessing what is true. Pray it with me. I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you were buried. I believe you rose from the dead. Your declaration is agreeing with God. I just pray it with me. I believe you rose from the dead and I believe you've made a way to the Father just for me. And so right now, I come. I am yours, Lord. I am yours. I give my heart to you. I give my life to you. I come. And I thank you that you hear me. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Thank you, Lord, that salvation is springing up all over this house and all over online. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, not by your own works, but by his grace. You're saved right now by the confession of truth in Jesus. For all my prodigal friends that are far from God right now, if you're near near someone, could you just grab an arm or a hand or a shoulder, put your hand on a shoulder, or grab a hand of a family member or a friend. If somebody just needs the comfort of God, they need to come back to God. They need the 
a nearness of God. If you brought a friend, just come on, just gather around them. Let's just love each other. Lord, we come under your grace and we say, Lord, may your family be restored. May your family be restored. May your prodigal sons and daughters be brought near. May families that need health and healing right now experience grace. And Lord, as we gather arms and gather hearts together, let all the prodigals come home. And Lord, pour out your healing grace. Amen. Our band's gonna sing. Let God seal his word in your heart. In just a moment, we'll come and close our service.